Good evening, all, and welcome. Firefighters and emergency service personnel have seen some absolutely horrifying stuff. And I'm warning you now, this video contains some very gruesome and explicit content, so viewer discretion is advised and a heavy trigger warning. But for now, it's time to get very uncomfortable and let the darkness take control. I'm going to share a story with you, but I'm going to give you a bit of context first. This is a story about the Happy Land Fire. Now, in November of 1988, it was actually ordered to close due to building code violations because of lack of fire exits, alarms, or sprinklers. But no follow-up by the fire department was ever documented. Enter... Julio Gonzalez, a guy who had served three years in prison in Cuba in the 1970s for desertion of the Cuban army. He managed to make his way to Florida and eventually settled in New York. He had an ex-girlfriend who happened to work in the Happy Land Club, and one evening he came urging her to quit. They got into an argument, and he screamed after she told him to go, that he was going to shut this place down, and that he was coming back. Knowing he was violent, she tried to warn people of what was about to happen, but alas, he returned with one dollar's worth of gasoline and spread the fuel at the base of the staircase, which happened to be the only access to the club, and then ignited it. Now, if you've heard what I've already told you, the fact that there were no fire exits, alarms or sprinklers, and the only exit being set ablaze can only mean one thing, right? Well, that is exactly what happened. He, with his one dollar worth of gasoline, managed to kill 87 people in total. That is horrifying. Only six people actually survived, and those who did weren't in the best of shape. But now back to me. I was actually helping move bodies out after the fire and subsequent investigation. The coroner's office was strapped to say the least. I was a New York City paramedic and got pushed into the service. The city had to borrow vans to remove the bodies into various areas for holding. Our borrowed van gave up after one of several trips, so we had to sit with four bodies bagged in the back of the van for another van to come and empty it for us, so the wrecker could take the van away. Another old Ford van backs up into ours, and we begin the slow process of lifting the bags one by one and handing your handholds to the guy in the other van so they could gingerly slide the body over. Mind you, this is all on a street in the Bronx. As I lift one of the bags, I hear a whistle within it. I opened the bag, violating the seal, just to be sure it wasn't a mistake that this person ended up in a bag. When airways meet superheated gas, the edema closes them, and as we moved the body, the air was released from the chest through a space in a shiny gold tooth, hence the body whistling at me. It still makes my skin itch whenever I think about it. With the intensity of the smoke and flame, it's unsurprising that some of the victims died so quickly they were found with drinks still in their hand. And if you're wondering about Gonzalez, who actually started the fire, he was caught the very next day, the day I was working on this, in fact. He was charged with 174 counts of murder, two for each victim, and was found guilty of 87 counts of arson and 87 counts of murder on August 19th, 1991. He received the maximum sentence of 25 years for life and died in prison on September 13th, 2016. This story happened to me about a month ago, and it's been haunting me for the past month. I've thought about it every free moment of every day, and it's tormenting me. Perhaps sharing it with you will make me feel better. I'm an EMT, and about a month ago we got a call from a really bad car accident involving two passengers. I found out after the fact 
that a teenager still in high school and his girlfriend decided it would be a good idea to drive at 90 plus miles an hour in a Mustang. A cop saw them and went to pull them over, but instead they took off. The guy took a turn way too fast and slid into a pole. We got to the scene and found the car had slid into the pole and wrapped itself around it. It almost looked like a game of horseshoe. The passengers inside hit the pole and his girlfriend was very clearly dead, likely on impact. Her head was flattened on one side, her eyes hanging out, brain oozing out of her nose and most major bones clearly broken. The teenage guy was still semi-conscious, looking around in shock, trying to figure out what had just happened. He had blood coming out of his ears and nose, his right cheekbone caved in. We managed to get him out of the car with surprising ease, as the driver's side of the door wasn't damaged. We cut him out of his clothes, put him on a stretcher with a collar on, and immediately had him in an ambulance and floored it the whole way to the hospital. I could see every time he took a breath, his broken ribs would pop in and out while I listened to his lungs fill with blood. I could see major bruising taking place on his torso and he was starting to fade. I had just become an EMT a few months before, so I was new and didn't really know what to do. All of a sudden he stopped breathing and we hooked him onto a ventilator. I was frantic. This was one of my first major calls and I'd never seen anything like this. My more experienced partner, a paramedic, remained calm and tried to assure me everything would be okay. Just as I was starting to calm down a bit more, the patient went into cardiac arrest. I began performing CPR and could feel his ribs were broken as I performed it while my partner hooked him up onto life support. Shortly after we arrived at the hospital, and my partner and I rushed out of the ambulance to get the patient into the hospital. A trauma team was already waiting for us. My partner told them everything that happened and the guy's mum arrived. She was frantic. I had to try and keep her away from her son as she asked me what happened. I explained to her that he was on life support and a ventilator and the hysterical mum said, life support? Yes, life support. And we're getting him into surgery as we speak. At this point, my partner comes over after relaying the information to the trauma team and the mum asks, so you mean to tell me if you took him off life support, he'd be dead? My partner solemnly replied back, no, what I mean to tell you is that he is dead and we are trying to bring him back. We excused ourselves as we had more calls to attend to. We found out later from the surgeon on hand that about 15 minutes after the arrival, the patient succumbed to his injuries. It's so haunting to me hearing his lungs fill with blood, seeing his broken ribs move with his breathing, seeing him look around in shock as he coughed up blood from his nose and mouth. I can't handle coins anymore because the metal smell reminds me of the smell of blood. I can't see things with ketchup, syrup, or the like, because it reminds me too much of it. I can't unsee any of the stuff and it still haunts me. I still have nightmares every night about it. I don't think I'm going to last in this job. My brother is an EMT and he shared this story with me. He attended a patient, male, obese, in excess of 500 pounds and unable to lift himself from the couch. He had been in that state for several weeks. When they attempted to remove him from said couch, a massive chunk of flesh begins to peel away from his body, exposing his muscle and his vertebrae. The patient, consequently, loses consciousness. Unable to remove the man from the couch without killing him, they attempt to keep him alive while he is attached to it. The fire department is called so they can cut the couch away and hopefully get him into the hospital intact. Forward to the ER. The surgeon concluded that there was no way to remove him from the couch and saving his life attempting to remove the couch would expose so much body to the outside that he could survive the surgery, but not the infections that followed. So, obviously, he didn't make it. I also have a shorter story. An ambulance called for a homeless man who complained about severe foot pain. Upon inspection of said foot, 
it comes off, just pulled away like an apple plucked from a tree, revealing the man's lower leg bones and a horrendous infection. He would survive, but not until he had his leg amputated at mid-thigh. I worked as an agency nurse in a small county hospital for a while. We got a call from a nursing home saying one of their patients is going downhill. We went through all of the motions, got the ER bed ready, MD was waiting also. The EMTs pull up and they're actively doing chest compressions. The paramedic is breathing for him with an ambu bag or bag valve mask. MD asks why he wasn't intubated, as the drive was half hour from the nursing home to the hospital. The paramedic said, you can try if you want, I can't move his head. So he asked me to roll up a blanket to place it under his shoulders, to make it so the doc can see the vocal cords so he can intubate the patient for all of you non-medical people. I place the blanket under his shoulders and head, and it's floating off the stretcher like he's doing a crunch. I applied pressure to the forehead to push down his head, but it didn't budge. I pushed hard enough to the point where I thought, any harder and I'm going to snap this guy's neck. Keep in mind he's flatlined this whole time, and we're continuing to give him breaths with the ambu bag in between all of this, but he's basically gone. The doc gets up, pushes down on his head, and snap. Head goes limp. Doc pronounces time of death. I will never forget the sound. It was actually very close to the noise you hear in movies when someone breaks someone else's neck. The doctor x-rayed it after and said all's done and his neck snapped at C4-5, to five, a clean break. We called the nursing home to let them know he had passed. I asked the nurse to read me off his story. He had anclusing spondylitis combined with a stroke. He didn't move or get out of bed, laying still without movement for such a long period of time removed the flexibility in his neck and caused his cervical spine to basically fuse. When we applied pressure to his forehead, we snapped his neck. It's the worst feeling ever when you do more harm than good. At the time, I was working as a live-in volunteer EMT at the fire department in my hometown. I lived in Maine, right near the New Hampshire border. It's a beautiful little vacation town. I miss it a lot, actually, and visit it often. It's a one streetlight, slow town, more trees than people. A lot of the firefighters in our town were born into it, and I'm no exception. My mother was the EMS chief, and we were all well-seasoned EMTs. She was a huge driving force in my life, and she pretty much made me who I am today. A stone-cold, life-saving machine. I thrived on adrenaline and Red Bull. Now that we've given you a little backstory, you can start to understand that I'm a rational person. While I do believe in the supernatural, I'm not one to see a flickering light and cry, Ghost! This, though, this experience nearly made me quit my lifelong dream job and leave the department I literally grew up in. I can't explain it. It was a night shift. It was part of a brand new live-in program to jumpstart our new EMT program. The chief said I was good during the day, but wanted me to have a few more people with me at night. For the record, I'm non-binary, but at the time I was identifying as female due to paperwork and general life confusion. So as such, was accompanied by two of my lifelong friends, big, tall, muscular guys who didn't scare easy. They also, for the record, did not believe in the paranormal. Their names were Tom and Charlie. So there we are in the dispatch room, which is basically where all the radios and security cameras are. There's a crappy TV box in the corner playing Andy Griffith reruns at 1am. You know, small town stuff. We have a door alarm in the vehicle bay, when someone walks into the building, it'll chime a loud ding-dong throughout the whole station. And when someone leaves through the same door, it chimes a single ding. So imagine our surprise when we hear the loud tell-tale ding-dong sound through the building. And they're loud, you can't mistake or miss them. Must be the chief checking on us, said Tom. Yeah, she hasn't been sleeping too well, I reply. She often likes to make sure we're okay. So we look up at the monitors and we expect to see her walking up to the door but there was no one. Then another loud ding-dong, and another. 
Bug must be blocking the sensor, Charlie yelled. Then it all stopped abruptly. We look at each other, open the door and call out, Chief? But no answer. I took a deep breath, grabbed my radio, and told the two other guys to watch the monitors, and if they see anything to have dispatch, send a sheriff our way. They agreed, and I started my sweep. It was more to just rule anything out and be safe. This was during the rise of the drug crisis, and despite being a secure building, drug addicts are crafty, better safe than sorry. I went around, and in each fire truck, all good. With each truck I checked, I just felt silly. No one was here. I was just being paranoid. But as I stepped around engine two, I saw what I swore was the hem of a little girl's dress starting around the forestry. What the hell, Ali? Ali was the fire chief's kid, but her being here in the middle of the night without the chief there was strange. I chased after her, but when I got there, nothing. I felt dread, raw fear gripping me. My radio started crackling and I check around me. I looked everywhere for the little girl and there was no sign of her. And the more I looked, the louder the static got. Suddenly the static stopped abruptly and a crystal clear girl's voice came through. You can't save everyone. The guys found me 20 minutes later sitting on the ambulance cot sobbing. I was really that messed up. One of my worst fears as a newbie EMT at the time was triage. For those of you who don't know, triage is when you have multiple patients and you have to decide who gets saved first, who's basically already dead, and who is okay enough to wait for additional resources. That night we had three separate multi-patient incidents. For many reasons I won't go into detail about them, but I seriously contemplated quitting. I don't know if it was someone messing with me that night over the radio but I still sometimes have nightmares about that night. I've seen some weird and messed up things, but this one, this one is just the one that sticks with me the most. Do you ever wonder what happens after the EMTs get there and take the body or patients away? That's when I show up. I am what they call biohazard remediation and forensic cleaners. We clean up blood, body fluids, and infectious materials you really don't want staying around, and occasionally even hoarders' homes. Oh yes, I've been in business 32 years and we've seen it all. Let me share with you a few of the things that we found on the job. One that I'll probably never forget, and is probably the worst mess I've ever had to clean up was a man who murdered his wife, two toddler children, and then turned the gun on himself. Rumor was he was having financial difficulty and was about to lose a really top paying job. He was used to providing the good life for his family and was very ashamed. A week before he committed this gruesome act, he was actually diagnosed with severe depression but refused to seek help for it. I went into the children's bedroom and saw little bloody handprints on the walls. I went home and couldn't sleep after that. I didn't dare tell my wife. It was a really sad story. Sometimes the less you know, the better. We have to separate our feelings when doing a job because we have to focus on doing it right. It takes a lot of work and dedication and is not a job that can be rushed. You don't want a family to come back home thinking it's a clean house and find a single bone fragment, specked blood or vomit. You better check the walls for bone fragments too. If it happens, grab the pliers. Putty knives are our best friend. They do a great job of scraping up brain matter from the floor and walls. When brain matter dries, you're not getting it out very easy. It turns into a cement-like consistency. And if that doesn't do the trick, we use truck-mounted steam injection machines, which melts the stubborn brain to get it out of there. As you can imagine, it's not a job for the faint of heart. The turnover rate is staggeringly high, and you have to have tough skin to be able to do it, and a strong stomach. I've seen a former employee throw up in his respirator mask, big, burly guy with a large skull tattoo on his forearm. He took the job because he claimed he could handle anything and loved horror movies, he quit the next day. 
I'm a first responder, and this happened nearly three years ago. We got a call for a woman who fell down and hit her head. The cops beat us there and begin speaking with the woman. Me and my partner get there and start taking a look at her head. She says she takes medicine but is unsure which type, so she told me to go to her bathroom to check her medicine cabinet for the pill she takes. When I get to the staircase to head upstairs, immediately there's a shotgun. Thankfully, my reflexes saved me. I think the guy just fired a random ass shot down the stairs near me. The cops didn't hesitate to take him out. They didn't even fire a shot. After the gunshot, there were no more. The guy came out peacefully. It's not exactly a murder attempt, but he did fire shots at someone in the hopes to harm them. So it counts in my book. I booked it straight outside and went into the ambulance. The officers ran in there blind. I didn't even say anything to them, and they had him in handcuffs after a few minutes. The woman actually ended up going to hospital for a concussion. But to think, I was just doing my job, and I could have died right then and there. I'm a medic and firefighter. I had a call once. I don't remember what we were initially called for, but they told the dispatcher they were in their barn. Something seemed off, and we looked through a window before going in. A shotgun was pointed at the door and rigged to fire if the door opened. The caller had hung themselves in the barn before we got there. My very first call as a medic after orientation with an EMT partner, the patient tried to stab me. I also had a gun pulled on me when I walked up to a vehicle involved in a rollover. He seemed fully intent on shooting and I was lucky I noticed and reacted quick enough. So, people trying to kill me is the general theme when trying to help people. I was working as a paramedic and my station had a mental hospital in our area. They knew they weren't allowed to call us for basic transports, that it had to be an emergency. We get a call there one night for a possible stroke on the fourth floor. We knew that the fourth floor is where they kept people who were guilty of murder and rape and that a police officer would be with us. When we get there, the nurse has this look on her face that we are really about to walk into something sketchy. She tells us that the lady won't stop looking to the left, her excuse for calling us and saying it was a stroke, and talking to something. When we walk into the room, she's in full conversation with something outside the window. We ask her to talk to us and she got quiet. We load her up and the LEO cuffs her into the gurney. When we get outside, she looks back up towards the window and quickly shoots out her head to the other side and says it's so cool how fast they fly. Five minutes from the hospital, she asks if I'm worried the ambulance will break down so that her and her flying yellow friends could rape and kill us. I said no, and she started screeching and laughing. The law enforcement officer was as white as snow and said nothing to her. We drop her off in the ER, come back outside and the ambulance had cut off and wouldn't start. I went back inside to ask the law enforcement officer if he had turned it off and they said no. He walked around inside with us and we couldn't find him and dispatch sent a bunch of cars to look but he wasn't at the hospital. They found him sitting in his cruiser back at the mental hospital and he couldn't remember quite how he got there. To this day I really think her and the officer saw something. I was an EMT for a while and got a call about someone who was riding their bike at breakneck speed. When they hit a car head first without a helmet, went over immediately. Despite the fact it was broad daylight and we were in the middle of suburbia on a Saturday, no one even came to check on this poor guy. Seriously, the streets were empty. Usually a massive crowd gathers around violent accidents like this. His skull was pretty much smashed in, so he was unresponsive. It was the worst head injury I'd ever seen. We assessed that he had a major skull fracture, a concussion, and was bleeding profusely. He was also missing teeth and had a minor road rash, but fortunately he wasn't missing much skin. To give you an idea of how bad it was, this is the kind of injury that most people don't survive. If you did survive, you'd probably be a crippled vegetable. 
Normally, we'd move him off the road, but when someone has a neck or head injury like that, it isn't very safe. My partner, who was also training me, as I was kind of new, went to check his pulse while I began to unload our gear. He crouched down, felt for a pulse for a while, and then stood up and opened his mouth to say something. When suddenly the guy jumped up, he didn't use his arms to pick himself up, he just jumped to his feet. It startled the two of us. He looked at us, gave us a smile, attempted to grab his bike, but we stopped him. But we didn't exactly want to wrestle him to the ground given his condition. He gets away from us and bolts into the woods without his bike. My partner was even more in disbelief than I was. He just stared at where the man had run off, mouth agape. And then he turned and muttered, he had no pulse, man. I asked him if he was sure. Then he swore up and down the biker was clinically dead. We contacted the authorities for assistance and they sent in search and rescue into the forest. I don't know if he was found or not because we normally don't get much information about patients after they go into professionals. Keep in mind this was the Pine Barrens so they had a lot of ground to cover. My best guess is that he went to a loved one's house out of confusion. What I found out about this was head injuries bleed like hell. So you'd think the guy would leave a long red trail of blood for the cops to follow. I was working in a small rural hospital at ER. The morgue and autopsy rooms were adjacent to the ER. A couple of EMTs came in to chat for a while as it was a slow night. They asked me if I had ever seen a drowning victim. I told them no and they wanted to show me this body in the morgue. So we went in there and pulled out a drawer where this body was laying on the tray. They are pointing out some stuff to me when suddenly they both ran out the door and flipped the light off. Now I'm standing a foot away from a dead body in the dark. Damn them. I worked my way over to the door and tried to get out. They were holding the door and laughing hysterically so I decided to be really quiet, not a peep. A few minutes later they began to worry and I could hear one of them say, you think she fainted? Then the door began to open slowly. As soon as I could get a foot in it and grip on it, I yanked it open and cussed the crap out of them. Morgue after midnight? No thank you. This happened when I was called out at eight in the morning. Me and my colleague who joins me in the car halfway there meet the police outside the outskirts of this town. It was obvious that the house was run down and practically grey due to age, but if you focus enough you could see that it was yellow as the actual house colour. It didn't help though that it was 8 in the morning in December in Sweden. Saying that for those of you who don't know means it's pitch black with knee high snow. The entrance was weirdly enough in the back of the house. It had a small stairway so it was difficult to bring the stretcher in. We walk up the stairs and see an obvious break-in attempt, broken glass on the window of a door, like someone grabbed the handle from the inside. The police said it was an anonymous call about the place, so it might have been a burglar or uninvited family member. Police said the family had practically no collection to the woman anymore. We walk in and meet a heavy stench, so we walk back to the car to gear up before any other action is needed. We walk in again, and now we notice there are several padlocks on each door in the narrow hallway, and tape to seal it further. Most shocking to me was the bathroom door that was straight ahead of us had two padlocks and full silicone sealing along the cracks. This is where we met the stench again through our masks. To the right was the living room where we walked in. There she was, laying in front of the couch, another four padlocks on the balcony door. She lay on her side, near an electrical heater, and near her face, what could only be described as a blanket. Upon further inspection, we realized her face was completely gone. It was surreal. But there, where the face should have been, we saw movement. Maggots had invaded the corpse. We lifted the blanket of her body, which apparently was a picnic blanket, the kind where there is isolation and plastic underneath and a fleece on top. Well, when we did this, it looked like a drowning accident. Blue and green bloating, and other various liquids secreting from the corpse. 
The only option was now a body bag. Grabbing her wrists was like sinking your hands into putty, with worms falling out of what would have been the mouth and eyes, seeing them crawl away in search of new feeding grounds. Unfortunately, the body bag did not hold in the moist stench that filled our lungs. Later that day, we prepped the body as best we could, seeing the rot. There was no possibility of embalming. We figured out that she had been in the living room floor for over a month. So we bathed her in a special bacterial killing liquid. That's the best we could really do besides removing as many of the worms as we could. They had made it to the lungs and were going for the heart. We then had a casket ready and her in the body bag in it. We had to prep it with two kinds of bacterial killing powders and three kinds of spray that kill any kind of smell of rot, which worked for a grand total of about five minutes. Two weeks later, the funeral finally takes place and the body can only be assumed to be one blob by now. The body had been soaked up in the wood, making it look like driftwood. That means she had been seeping out through the zip of the body bag. The family came along to the church and only 15 others came in. They asked about the minor smell like someone had passed gas. But for us, it was obvious this wasn't going to be pleasant. 30 minutes in and the whole church was filled with the smell and another half hour goes by and people leave early. When the ceremony was done, they wanted to complain about the smell and were going to ask about it in the gathering slash reception of the funeral. We didn't have the stomach to tell them there most likely wouldn't have been a body there anymore. I had just started a job as an apprentice mortician. Well, I'm working on a body when my superior comes in with a few people wheeling someone in. We shut the door to the lab and they move the body. When my superior goes, oh crap, we should have put him on the deeper table. And then the smell hit me. I had to go outside for about 20 minutes. The lead mortician came out and got me and explained to me that they had to switch the body fluids with embalming fluids for open casket. And when it's a larger human, they have a special tray table in order to let the blood and other body fluids pour out onto the table. Well, I, as I said, was just a rookie doing the job and had never seen that amount of blood that was overflowing on every side of the tray and was easily one of the worst messes and most vile things I have ever seen. I was living in Lacey, Washington when this happened in an apartment complex located just off Ruddle Road. The road has a nasty curve not too far away that was prone to car accidents, especially at night. Some serious, while others, fatal. One evening while watching TV in the living room, the power suddenly flickered and blinked out. Seconds later, I could hear the sound of a car crashing on the main road. In the silence that followed, I decided to put on my shoes and black trench coat and run up the road to see if anyone needed help. When I got to the road, I immediately looked to my left, where the infamous curve was. There, in the small stand of trees that lined the road, was an overturned car. From what I could tell, the car had taken out a power pole on the other side of the road before careening into the small stand of trees coming to rest on its hood. Next to the car, there was a small yet thick crowd of people standing in a circle. I jogged over having to practically push my way through the crowd to find out what they were staring at. At the center of this macabre crowd was a young woman. She was moaning and writhing around, eyes wide in terror, and wet with tears as she kept scanning the crowd of silent observer and pleading for help with her gaze. I dashed in, knelt down beside her and grasped her left hand. The crowd took a collective step back, and it was then I suddenly remembered a story from my childhood. It's called The Crowd. Let me quickly share it with you in order for you to understand. In the book series called Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, there is a story called The Crowd in which a man who went up in a car wreck after being dragged out of the car finds himself surrounded by a thick crowd of silently watching people who don't move, don't speak and just stare at him. When the paramedics arrive, the crowd vanishes. This is the only story in the series that truly frightened me. Little did I know years later, I would have my own 
encounter with the crowd. It appeared that these people were them. It was real. They were all around us. And it felt like I was keeping this crowd from coming closer to do who knows what. Look at me, just look at me, I say, trying to push down my own fear. To my relief, her eyes flick to mine. You're gonna be okay. Has anyone called 911? I say loudly. There was no response from the crowd of onlookers. I quickly fished out my cell phone, dialed it myself, one hand on my phone, the other grasping the woman's hand. It was an agonizing few minutes before the paramedics arrived and I kept speaking to her, both to keep us calm and keep her from looking at the people. When the paramedics finally arrived, the entire crowd abruptly vanished, exactly like in the story I read. I didn't let go of the woman's hand until I was literally shoulder to shoulder with the paramedics. At that point, I walked back to the sidewalk and looked around. There were only a few other neighbors on the opposite side of the street, watching what was going on. Other than the paramedics, the injured woman, and myself, the street was deserted. I shuddered, looked at the woman one more time and then ran back home. To this day, I can't remember the ending of what was the scary story. I feel like I don't need to know. I saw it with my own eyes. I've been an EMT for about six months, and I had someone I know for years walk up to me and say, I don't feel well, and then drop unresponsive to pain. Breathing getting slower and weaker, no team to support me and no prep time on the way to the scene or anything. I was pretty shaken afterwards, but it also made me realize that the training works. By the time the ambulance responded, which was just a few minutes away, I had blood pressure, oxygen, blood sugar, and had him on oxygen while monitoring breathing and getting ready to start bagging him. While this was a bit scary, it also gave me a lot more confidence in my own abilities. About a year ago, me working as a firefighter, I got dispatched for traffic control by a fellow company for lines down on a high traffic road at 7.20 a.m. We arrive at the scene and see a huge wire smack dab in the middle of the road. What we didn't realize was there was a large triaxle logging truck laying in a ditch just 20 feet away that we passed arriving on scene. At first glance, I literally said, looks like the neighboring company had a big tree fall down. Nope, it was just a truck covered in logs. It was said that the driver managed to survive the horrific accident. We didn't actually finish till 4 p.m., but I nearly died several times because people don't know how to drive, and I was nearly run over several times while trying to direct traffic. Working as a firefighter can be very dangerous, and I've had a few instances where I thought I was going to die. One of the first and most horrifying was when I was in a burning structure. It was pretty gnarly in there when all of a sudden my air pack regulator malfunctioned. As you can imagine, being deep inside a fire and smoke infested building with suddenly no air is a bad idea. And I got absolutely no warning. I thought I was going to die. I managed to make it out unscathed, but you try running through a burning building with only the oxygen left in your lungs and you'll understand what true horror is. Second to that was when I was attending another fire. The building I was in suddenly had the burning roof and wall collapse on my partner and I. I was literally trapped and unable to squirm out. It was extremely hot and I was running out of air fast, waiting to get dug out. I was pretty sure there was a good chance I wasn't going to make it through that one. I'm very lucky to have survived both. I could have easily died in any of these situations. I'm a firefighter, and me and my team were called to attend a building that was almost fully engulfed in flames. We arrive and I kicked the door down and kneeled down in the corner. When I started hitting the fire across the room, when my right side got really hot. Turns out I was leaning against a couch that quickly lit up, 
but no one else could see because of the sheer amount of smoke between the wall and us. So naturally I turned my attention to it and put it out. It was about that time I feel a tap on my shoulder and one of the guys was telling me to hit the ceiling. It had almost instantly become engulfed. Now for those of you who don't know, when the ceiling is set ablaze, it's probably not gonna be long before it falls in on itself. A few seconds after that happened, we hear a ping when we realize that some of the firearms and munitions that have been stored in the house are starting to pop off, which makes it even more exciting and dangerous. Of course, at this point, the best thing to do is exit. As I'm making sure everyone is out and I'm the last to leave, with seconds to spare, this ceiling behind me collapses in on itself, almost crushing me. If I had been in there a moment too late, I would certainly be dead. I'm afraid that house was never saved. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Well done for making it through to the end of the video. You are amazing. It is, um... We had some pretty dark stories here, so yeah, hope you had a strong stomach for them. If you liked the video, don't forget to leave a like, leave a comment down below too, subscribe and press the bell icon if you've made it this far, and thank you for tuning into Mortis Media with new stories every week. Sorry about the no Tuesday video, uh, I'm gonna be honest, I have this category called general stories, which I filter stuff into every once in a while, and I started reading them the other day and I got about 20 minutes in but because it's been there so long and I haven't done it in such a long time the stories just really weren't up to the quality I usually want for stories and yeah I, I just started narrating them and felt really disappointed and um, it was a bit too late to make a video then and things just got really complicated so I couldn't actually do it so I'm really really sorry but I hope to see you again on Saturday but with that being said, I'd like to extend a huge thank you as always to my members and patrons who get some funky benefits for signing up, like the names on the credits that you can see now. But let's wrap things up here. Stay awesome, stay safe, please don't drive too fast, and I'll see you in the next one.